Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us closing out the book of 1 Corinthians, chapters 15 and 16. And chapter 15 certainly is the pinnacle of the book. We see 58 masterful verses concentrating on the doctrine of salvation, especially on the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. This teaching is absolutely necessary for each and every church because the resurrection is the linchpin on the doctrine of salvation. If Jesus had stayed dead in the grave, it would prove that he was false, either a deliberate liar or a self-deceived loon. But Christ's resurrection proved that everything he said and did was true, it proved his sacrifice on the cross was found acceptable in the Father's sight, and it sealed salvation for all who believe in him. And apparently false teachers were affecting the Corinthian church by teaching what the Sadducees taught against the resurrection of the dead teaching that there is no resurrection. So Paul responds by concentrating his attention on the reality and results of Christ's resurrection. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 19 is the reality of the resurrection. And Paul does this by first focusing on these various proofs that the Lord Jesus has given as to the fact that he is indeed resurrected from the grave. Five of them, in fact, the first is that real people were really being saved, such as right there in Corinth. That's a proof in and of itself that Jesus rose from the dead. We see in verses 1 and 2. We see in verses 3 and 4 that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection were prophesied about in the Scriptures, that is, the Old Testament. Consider passages such as Psalm 16, 8 through 11, which was referenced by Peter in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 25 through 31. Or Isaiah 53, which speaks of the Messiah, or the suffering servant, being punished in our place, dying, and yet also returning to life to enjoy the results of his victory. A third proof of Christ's resurrection is in verses 5 through 7. It's the fact that so many eyewitnesses saw him alive in the flesh, even though Jesus had indeed been crucified and buried. Peter, the rest of the twelve, Christ's half-brother James, and then 500 others all see Jesus risen from the grave before his ascension. And a fourth proof is after his ascension with the eyewitness that is Paul. He saw Jesus in the flesh after Christ had already gone back to heaven in verses 8 through 10. And finally, verse 11, the commonality of the gospel proclamation by the true apostles and prophets and pastor teachers is a proof of the power of Christ evident in his resurrection. Well, after laying out these five proofs, Paul spends time teaching on really the horrific consequences if there is no resurrection from the grave, as the Sadducees had believed. And these consequences include the fact that Christ himself would still be dead, verse 13. The preaching the gospel would be pointless and empty, verse 14. Also, verse 14, faith in Christ would be worthless. Verse 15, Christians, and especially those who proclaim the gospel, like the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers, would be found to be liars. Verse 17, we'd be remaining unforgiven in our sins. And that means, of course, verse 18, all dead Christians would be in eternal hell. And verse 19, Christians would be the world's most pitiable people. But then we see, of course, in verses 20 through 58, the results of Christ's resurrection. Verse 20, a great reassurance from Paul after reading verses 12 through 19 that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah. And one result of Christ's resurrection is that it set in motion God's plan to resurrect all those who are in Christ Jesus, all those who have trusted in the Lord. Jesus is the new and better Adam we see in verses 20 through 23. So we see ultimately throughout Scripture that those saved by God's grace through faith in Christ who die prior to the tribulation period will experience resurrection at the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14. We also see that the resurrection of Old Testament saints, those saved before Christ, and tribulation saints, those saved after the rapture, will happen at the end of the tribulation as Christ establishes his kingdom, we see in Revelation 20. After Christ's millennial kingdom comes to an end, he will hand it over to the Father after he has put all things in subjection under his feet, verses 24 through 28. Some more results of Christ's resurrection are in verses 29 through 34. Christians have a hope of being reunited with their loved ones who were saved by Christ. Christians will experience constant peril by the world system for following Christ. And Christians will be sanctified, kept from being corrupted and deceived by false theology. Another result of Christ's resurrection is the fact we see in verses 35 through 57 that Christians now look forward to new eternal bodies which are spiritual and yet also physical. The natural bodies that we have are corrupted by sin and the death 
and decay and disease that sin brought into our race through Adam. But the new bodies that Christians look forward to, given through Christ, will be received when we're glorified in the twinkling of an eye. Our bodies will actually be changed and we'll be able to dwell with the Lord forever in a physical body that's not our natural body. It's spiritual in the sense that it is not riddled with sin. In fact, it will be incapable of sinning and will dwell with him forever. We see that in Revelation 21 and 22. And then in verses 54 through 58, we see a final result of Christ's resurrection is the Christian's victory over sin and death found by God's grace through faith in Jesus. True victory lasts forever in verse 54. Verses 54 and 55, true victory swallows up death. True victory disarms sin, verse 56. True victory is only through Christ, verse 57. And true victory changes the victor, verse 58. We now live for the Lord. Well, then we get to chapter 16. Those 24 verses are final instructions and greetings, very similar to other books that Paul writes, the other letters that he writes. Almost all of them have a final set of instructions and some greetings. So the instructions here include setting aside an offering for the saints in Jerusalem. Notice this offering is not a specific amount or percentage, but rather as he may prosper in accordance with what the Lord has provided us. Notice also that church leaders must be morally and doctrinally qualified, as we read in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. They have to be this way, or they cannot be trusted to take care of the household of the Lord, and that would include taking care of the offering given by the people of God. Also, Paul gives example of what it's like to be faithful to God in ministry. Notice, he's got making plans, but his hands are open, his palms are open. He's recognizing that God directs our steps and will move him how he will. We see instruction concerning treating Timothy and Apollos, those fellow servants of Paul, well, as well as how to respond to Stephanus and his household. Remember, those are the ones that Paul said he baptized with water in chapter 1, verse 16. And apparently Stephanus and his household, they're the first to believe in Christ in the region of Achaia. We also see in verses 13 and 14 the exhortation that Christians are to be of good courage and strong, with the men especially acting like men. That means to be firm, uncompromised, watchful, but also loving all at the same time. And that's a model after Jesus Christ. And the greetings to Corinth include being from Aquila and Prisca or Priscilla. They were instrumental in the planting and strengthening of the church in that city, Acts 18, 1 and 2. Paul ends with the exclamation, Maranatha, O Lord, come, looking ahead to the return of Christ Jesus. Well, a great passage to meditate on from the end here of the book of 1 Corinthians is chapter 15, verses 54 through 58. But when the perishable will have put on the imperishable and the mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. If you do not have that victory, I pray you would repent from your sin this very day. Trust in Christ Jesus in his forgiving grace to save you from eternal wrath that all mankind deserves because of our sin, but that Christ willingly took on the cross if only you would believe in him. And then, having believed, let us live for the Lord. Let us always abound in the work of the Lord. Be steadfast and immovable as we live according to his word. This has been 1 Corinthians chapters 15 and 16, and I hope you have a great day.